So in the last portion of the talk, we'd like to cover a few items related to treatment. So there are two validated symptom scores that can be used clinically. One of them is called the ACQ, which is called the Asthma Control Questionnaire, and this one, which is called the Asthma Control Test, ACT. The ACQ, which is not shown here, is a similar questionnaire. It's usually five or six questions, and it relates to asthma symptoms over the last week, one week. This one, the ACT, is a nice one because it shows you the Likert scale of one to five of what's going on over the last four weeks. So if you're seeing somebody maybe in clinic every you know, month or so, this is a really good one. When you see somebody every six months, it's very hard for them to remember six months. It's not very accurate. However, when they look at uh, the last week on the ACQ or in this one, the last uh, four weeks, they can do a much more accurate job of recalling their symptoms. How much did your asthma keep you from getting as much work done as you wanted? It's like from going to school or doing things around the house. How often has the patient had shortness of breath? How often did your asthma symptoms wake you up at night or earlier than you wanted to in the morning? During the past four weeks, how much are you using your rescue inhaler, that albuterol, for example? And how would you rate your asthma control over the past four weeks? This turns out, if you have a quantitative score, we usually report the total score in our clinical notes, and we often report the average score. And we can use this as we follow people. It's a bit of a quantitative measure, so it's not only qualitative assessment. So one thing I'd like you to remember is the rules of two in for, for asthma severity and control. For mild, persistent, or lack of control, we think of nighttime awakenings at least twice a month, short-acting beta agonist use for symptoms, not before exercise, two days a week. Uh, week during the week, symptoms, two days a week. These questionnaires that I was just telling you about these are the scores. The one I was just showing you was on a five point scale. So a, less, a total score less than 20 would be a good measure for the, for the twos, let's just call it that. Lung function reduced by 20% and exacerbations two times per year. So less than these measures is generally good. More than these measures suggest you've lost control of the asthma and more therapy or more interventions are required. Moderate, it's daily or weekly um, symptoms, and uh, FEV1s, if you've had more than a 40% reduction, we worry about uh, moderate severity. Well, this is the, the guidelines that have been put out by that expert panel report three. And you can see it's like a step, a, a set of stairs, step one to step six. People with step one, they have intermittent asthma. And so the only thing we would prescribe for them medically would be short-acting beta agonists for as-needed use, not even regular daily use. Of course, we would do patient education and environmental control if it's relevant. And for step two, we now get into the persistent asthma, more mild, moderate, and severe. And so the first thing we would think about adding as a preferred strategy would be low-dose inhaled corticosteroids more medium dose for step three. And then step four would be medium dose plus the long acting beta agonists. And then high dose inhaled corticosteroids and long acting beta agonists and a biological therapy such as the anti-IG medicine homolizumab if it's an allergic patient and they would qualify. And then high dose, sorry, uh, step six for the most severe patients so you would have all those plus oral corticosteroids. So these are the steps that we think about to try to achieve control of asthma. Let's talk about the short-acting beta agonists. This is the most effective medication for relief of acute bronchospasm. And again, we try to track the frequency that people use this. So more than two times a week, other than maybe pre-medicating for exercise, would suggest inadequate asthma control. And we generally do not recommend regular use of this medication. This could actually 
because of tachyphylaxis, lower its effectiveness, and it may actually increase airway hyperresponsiveness. Albuterol, um, using a, a safe propellant, is the most commonly available medication here. I'm not sure what's available there. It might be salbutamol, salbutamol um, but they work the same way. These meter dose inhalers, uh, it turns out, contain propellants, including chlorofluorocarbons, which damage the ozone layer in the environment. So many countries, the US included, uh, began to outlaw these CFCs. And so the companies generated more environmentally friendly propellants, and the HFA is one of these mechanisms. And these have largely in the US replaced CFCs. So we see these medications, and for albuterol, we see medications like Proair HFA or Proventil HFA or Ventolin HFA. Right now, we in the US do not have a generic version of albuterol HFA, but this is the preferred short acting beta agonist. It's very important to teach your patients the proper use of uh, these inhalers. I'm going to um, kind of, I'm going to go into something, excuse me, just one moment here. Because what I'd like to do is show you a video. Okay, now I'm going to share my screen again here. So this is not how you do it. Let's put it that way. I'm gonna move these pictures. This is an episode from a TV, it's a clip from a TV show in the US called House. And it's entitled, Do I Look Like an Idiot? And it's about an, his interaction with an asthma patient trying to teach her how to use her inhaler. Well, sometimes doctors make mistakes. Anna, you need to try twice as hard to fix them. Are you using your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Do I look like an idiot? No. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? Check. Okay. So that is not how you use your inhaler. <laughs> okay, so let me, um, actually, let me, give me two seconds here. I wanna try to show you the, the wheezing sounds again. Hold on just a moment. Uh, oh well, sorry, I don't have it uh, at the ready. And I don't wanna keep you waiting. I'm gonna share my screen back to the talk. Okay. So um, the next class of medications are long acting beta agonists. So this is just a pharmacological variant of uh, albuterol, but these last for a much longer period of time. These are not a substitute for anti-inflammatory therapy, and they're really not appropriate for monotherapy. They're not for acute symptoms or exacerbations, but what we do is we add these generally to inhaled corticosteroids, and this allows us to lower the inhaled corticosteroid dose quite a bit. There was a black box warning uh, for the use of these medications. Um, and this was because concern for increased risk of death, very small, but a, an increased risk of death in, this, in the setting of the severe asthma exacerbation. And this was important, in, especially in um, the black population. This has been now uh, studied and re-investigated uh, and it appears that um, this is not a, a very important risk. Uh, however, there is still concern uh, that uh, if people were to use these medicines alone without inhaled corticosteroids, then this could be a problem. 
Now the, the, the risk would be increased asthma activity, increased asthma exacerbation. So if you're following your patients closely, then what you would see is just asthma going out of control if they're on this medicine alone. So it's not something off you know, to the side, it's, it's definitely their asthma. But in general, we do not recommend using these medications without concomitant inhaled corticosteroid use. So inhaled corticosteroids, these are the most effective controller medications we have available. We generally use a spacer to try to decrease some of the local deposition in the mouth that can cause thrush, and in the airway that can cause a change in the voice called dysphonia, both of which are treatable or reversible, but you need to watch for them. A spacer, the larger droplets fall into the spacer rather than into the mouth, and the smaller uh, droplets that are respirable go all the way deep into the lungs where they where you'd like them to go. Long-term use of these medicines can cause some side effects shown here. And we generally uh, use these as needed. Um, and this is uh, uh, in mild persistent asthma in adults and children, but more regularly in more moderate and severe uh, asthma subjects. We um, again use these in combination with the long-acting uh, beta agonists, okay? If you look at data such as this, there's many, many different uh, similar data sets that have been generated. Budesonide is an inhaled corticosteroid, you can see in red. Here's placebo in green. And this is one of those anti-leukotriene agents called Zafirlucast. And these are asthmatics and symptoms triggering a course of inhaled or oral corticosteroids, so a, an exacerbation of asthma. And this is people without an event, and over time, this is the event rate. And you can see that with placebo, there's an event rate here in green that goes down to about 70% or so over this period of time of about a year. With budesonide, you've prevented some of those events so that it's now 80% instead of 70%. Whereas the anti-leukotriene is good for treating the immediacy of the symptoms, but it's not really preventing the asthma exacerbation rate above placebo. So high dose inhaled corticosteroid treatment is generally four puffs a day of the highest formulation you can, uh, you can use. So that would be, for example, two puffs a day in the, two, excuse me, two puffs in the morning, two puffs in the evening with good rinsing of the mouth. And the combinations that are approved of inhaled corticosteroid and the long acting beta agonists, this is what's available in the US are what's shown here, Advair, Symbacort, Dolera, Airduo, and Generic. Um, there is a generic form of this. And mostly these are for motorol combinations with a different inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, Advair is Salmeterol with this inhaled corticosteroid. There are now more recently some super long acting beta agonist combinations. They tend to be uh, once a day drugs instead of twice a day drugs. And here are a few of them. And here's the inhaled corticosteroid. And this is the long, long acting beta agonist, the super long acting one. And you can see that there comes in two strengths. And we think about these as one puff per day, but they're equivalent to um, this combination of fluticasone and salmeterol and the doubling here, which are twice a day um, administrations. So you might have these available, if not already soon, in your environment. The leukotriene modifiers, uh, we generally think to target these. This is like that uh, Montelukast or Zafirlucast drug. This seems to be extremely helpful in aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. So if somebody has a sensitivity to aspirin, we think about this. And they're quite helpful in exercise induced asthma. Um, they're an alternative. If your patient has problems with inhaled corticosteroids, this would be an alternative treatment as an asthma controller. And generally in severe asthma, because it's most often a treatment refractory condition, we would add this on in addition to everything else to try to get control of the asthma. One thing that we've found with broad use of these is that some of these patients that we think have asthma actually have vasculitis, something called EGPA, eosinophilic uh, granulo granulomatosis, or what used to be called Churg-Strauss syndrome. 
And so if you have people that you have controlled on steroids and you, you start to taper the, the steroids as you get control with the leukotriene modifier, watch out that they might not have a, a disease that's masquerading as asthma. Anti-IgE therapy uh, called Zolaire or omalizumab is the generic form is available here in the States. I'm not sure if it's available to you guys, but if it is, we think about this for people with poor control, uh, step five and the steps that I showed you, and an allergic component to their disease. We measure the serum IgE level, and generally if it's between 30 and 700, um, or if there's positive skin testing or a RAS test to an allergen, we think about this medication. And it helps to reduce exacerbations by a quarter to a half of the frequency. The FEV1 may increase a little bit, but it's mostly about controlling exacerbations. And not all patients respond, importantly. There's some very rare toxicity, anaphylaxis being one of them. So as people are starting on this medication, we'll often observe them uh, for a half hour to an hour or so after they get their first injection, just to make sure there's no problems. And then anti-IL-5 is a, an anti-cytokine-directed therapy that is targeting eosinophils. IL-5 is, is basically like nutrition for eosinophils, excuse me. And uh, this supports the activation and growth of eosinophils, the numbers of eosinophils. And there's already medications now, biologics that are antibodies that are anti-IL-5 that are reducing eosinophils. They also help to reduce exacerbations by about 50% in people that have frequent exacerbations, so more than two per year, and they have elevated circulating blood levels of eosinophils. So what's the number there? It's at least 150, and we think about it most in people with blood eosinophil counts of 300 or higher. This is variable. It has much less effect on FEV1 and symptoms, but it does help to prevent exacerbations. And there's even a treatment here that's called bronchial thermoplasty, which basically is we're using a bronchoscope and radio frequency to ablate the smooth muscle in the airways. So this is causing an airway injury that prevents the airways from contracting. And this is obviously only used in the most rare circumstances with people that are uh, highly severe asthma, very morbid, and no other medical therapy has worked. So acute exacerbations, these asthma attacks, are one of the most important uh, aspects of morbidity from asthma. And when you're treating somebody with an asthma attack, and these are people you're likely to see in the hospital, they would have um, um, real, uh, so they would have shortness of breath that's even out of proportion to the symptoms that you can hear because a lot of times their airways are so constricted, they're not moving much air and sometimes it can be even really hard to hear wheezing. So you wanna, if people show up with an acute exacerbation of their asthma, take this very seriously. It's okay to use uh, short acting beta agonists like albuterol, even every 20 minutes for the first hour or two of treatment in this setting. We often give 40 to 60 milligrams of prednisone as a burst, and then we'll taper it over a week or two weeks. And then usually we do not need antibiotics. As I mentioned, this is most commonly viral um, in origin, although it can be even allergic in origin. So when we think about antibiotics and for acute severe asthma, it, the cautionary notes are that the purulent appearing sputum that people might uh, expectorate actually is eosinophilic, not neutrophilic. And in studies that have been done in the past during asthma attacks, Transtracheal aspirates have been obtained, and there's really no greater prevalence of bacterial pathogens than amongst controls without respiratory disease. And empiric antibiotics have been tried with no proven benefit, in, even in hospitalized patients with acute attacks. So I would caution you against using antibiotics in general, unless you are um, quite convinced that they have an, uh, a bacterial infection. <clears throat> so when do we think about, if we're seeing somebody in clinic, sending them to the emergency department. Well, we think about this when our beta agonists, our effects are not lasting more than an hour. So if you give somebody a short acting beta agonist like albuterol and they get short of breath very quickly thereafter, 
that's a worrisome sign. If they're unable to complete sentences, they should be able to speak in full sentences. But if they're not, we, we get quite worried about them. And then if you have somebody who you know has been high risk in the past and they start to have uh, increased symptoms, you would have a much lower threshold for sending those people to the emergency department for urgent treatment. So definition of high risk would be newly diagnosed asthma that you don't really know well, that's now quite active. If people are already on daily prednisone before admission, if they've had two or more emergency department visits in the last six months, if they've had a, at least one prior hospitalization in the last year, and certainly if they've ever been intubated with respiratory failure or asthma, and if there's some important psychosocial problems that relate to the home environment, that puts them at increased risk for not following through on the prescribed treatment. So the five point plan to achieve asthma control. First, make the correct diagnosis. Second, modify environment if you can. Use the medications as we've discussed to control asthma. Have a plan with your patient for dealing with an asthma exacerbation. Don't wait till it happens. Stay in front of that. Make a plan of what will happen if the asthma gets worse and take advantage of consultation if needed. When do you think about the specialist, somebody who has a lot of experience with asthma? When you're uncertain about the diagnosis, you're having trouble getting good control, if you need to keep people on systemic steroids for control, lots of emergency department visits or hospitalizations, or if you're having unacceptable side effects of medications. So points to remember, rules for two, for initiation of controllers and for stepping up. And when we step up, we start with an inhaled corticosteroid, we go to higher doses, <coughs> excuse me, we add on the long-acting beta agonist, we go to moderate doses now, and then high dose. And then if look for aggravating factors, have a broad differential diagnosis, all that wheezes is not asthma. Look at your IgE level and your eosinophil counts, think about other therapies like biologics, and consider the high-risk patient. Thank you for your attention. And I hope this provided a nice broad overview of the pathobiology, assessment, and treatment considerations for asthma.